delicious drinks with brandy, that'll get people excited Are about you it. suggesting that it needs a little bit of a uh, rebranding in the uh, drinking culture? All right, welcome back to another episode of Global Wine News. As always, if you do enjoy some of the friendly and fun little banter that we have on here, definitely click the subscribe button below. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Brendan. We have Noah and Henry, and we're going to delve straight into it. Three little tidbit sizes of wine news. Well, we've, got, we've got fucking pterodactyls in here. Yeah. What's going on with pterodactyls? We have bar flies. I mean, we've got three sitting in front of the camera right hey. now. All right, first up we have... The Guardian reports, do old vines really make the best wines? Hunting for abandoned vineyards. Now, Noah, Noah, do you know much about uh, like the, the argument between old vines and, and young vines? Uh, I know a bit, but not a lot. Um, I guess that uh, the idea is that the older vines are probably more established in the ground. They, the roots have reached deeper and probably are more self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Don't need irrigation, anything like that. Um, I, I know yield quality drops, so you get a bit more uh, yield levels drop, so you get more fruit, fruit concentration. Um, but yeah, that's probably my extent. Henry, you're a fan of your dad's wines. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know that um, uh, in the Barossa, Barossa in particular has a very, very high concentration of of old vine uh, Syrah or Shiraz, as we like to Oldest, say. Oldest uh, Grenache vines in the world, I believe. Oldest Shiraz vines in the world, perhaps Grenache. as well. Grenache as well. Um, have you ever, like, has that ever come into sort of your buying habits in terms of... Not in my buying habits. I've certainly tasted a few wines that are from older vines and... Yeah, it's really, I, I, I don't think that there's anything that I've been able to pick out with my wine tasting palette that said, yeah, this is definitely a vineyard that's been around for a hundred plus years as opposed to something that's pretty fresh. Uh, but I, you know, coming at, into the wine world and not knowing much about it, it seems like there's a lot more prestige with older vineyards. Uh, it's sort of like that whole, you know, you can put a higher price on a bottle because we've been doing it for so long. So like pay me for my, like pay me for the respect that I deserve sort of thing. Like give me my money. Well, it's actually really interesting. So the, the article here goes and talks about the reasons why, um, you know, old vines are uh, often deemed better, but they do actually clarify. It's actually one of the first articles that I actually really agree with. Um, many very bad wines are actually made from very old vines as well. It's not, right. it doesn't, it's not guarantee of any good wine. Um, but I want to clarify something this. They actually say there is, uh, you know, you note a, uh, a difference in, in yield. Uh, they say four tonne of grapes per hectare, about two tonnes per acre. That's, that's about average for, you know, something, uh, vines that have, uh, a decent amount of age. I say 10 year old vines though, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. 10 year old vines would be more in the 50 ton per hectare range. Nah, uh, maybe, maybe, shit, maybe in the river Depends land. how much water you give it. Yeah, it would have to be heavily irrigated, barrel pruned, double cordon, um, probably more accurately around about the 10 to 12 hectare range for a 10 year old vine. So just to clarify that. Um, but it's interesting, the, the whole concept that we're doing with, uh, you know, a lot of like site um, appropriate great varieties that we do obviously with Unico, mm -hmm. got Fiano, Nera Davila. Um, this is really mimicked by old vines, the same effect. So yeah. do you know that vines themselves actually have, there's an, basically uh, there's an inner genome which remains relatively unchanged. There's actually an external genome that is highly mutagenic. So it's it's part of the reason why uh, like I believe I believe I'm paraphrasing here, but the inner genome of both Tempranillo and Grenache are actually the exact same grape variety. Wow, they're actually identical. They just evolved uh, like not not that far apart in the grand scheme of things, but they've evolved in in different areas for such a long time that they've changed their external genome so much. So that same family tree, different cousins. So technically, the same. It's like it's like having a twin brother that right. was raised in Russia uh, and you were raised here. I know here. what that's like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you saying vines are like the mid early 2000s classic uh, with Lindsay Lohan parent trap? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, except, except I think this comes down to, what is it, what is it like, um, like there's, there's- in, Nature is it, versus nurture. Nature, exactly right. Yeah. That's why we have you here, Henry. Uh, <laughs> but no, the, it is like a nature versus nurture. Nature does indeed change grapevines. Uh, and if, if a vine has been there for, you know, nigh on 100 to 150 years, then it's, it is going to actually uh, change the way that it grows, how it grows in respondents to yeah, you know, that so one of the area. One of the grapes goes to uni and gets a liberal arts degree and the other one gets interested in V8 supercars and then you made it at family Christmas once year and you're like, far out, how are we related? <laughs> Yes, that is that is exactly how Tempranillo and Grenache work. Shout, shout out, switch, yeah, shout out to all my family from Queensland. Good to see you guys. How are we? 
But so the, the value is environmental. Old vines tend to require far fewer treatments and thrive without irrigation. This is all absolutely true. Uh, it's part of the reason why you have, I guess, the the ability to make really great wine from old vines. But if you're a pretty shitty winemaker, so then that's, that's it doesn't really save you. Because you're not trying to establish it. It's essentially like trying to grow a good lawn because when you've got a new lawn coming in, you need to give it lots of water, lots of yeah. care. But if you've got something that's been growing there for ages, you can sort of let it go a little bit. Is that, so yeah. the older vines are just more established so you don't have to pander them quite as much? Exactly right. Um, they basically like there's a central root that digs deeper down into the surface and can draw water by itself, mm -hmm. um, rather than just like literally turning on the taps. Sweet. So not much of a news piece to begin with, but something I actually found really interesting uh, regarding obviously the difference between old vines and young vines and why they are different and why they are distinct. But onto the most important news piece of the week. Mm -hmm. I found this on uh, Yahoo News, the, uh, the reputable uh, news program that we all love to follow. Um, Aldi fans are making, is it Capri Suns or Capri Suns? Capri. Uh, Capri yeah. uh, with frozen fruit bags. Uh, I actually navigated to this Facebook group. The Aldi Nerd Facebook group uh, has oh. one of the, yeah, Aldi nerds. There's basically a whole bunch of people out there that that just freak out about just weird hacks that you can achieve in Aldi. Uh, they have one and a half million members. Um, wow. And what they're doing is they're grabbing, they're grabbing 32 ounce bags of frozen fruit. Now we'll chuck some photos up uh, on the video for you, but for you guys, I've got some here. Um, and they're grabbing bottles of Aldi's Fruity Pacific Fruit Vineyards Wines. They use a bottle each of peach wine, a bottle of pineapple wine, and two bags of frozen fruit and make them into these. Oh, hell oh yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, far this out. This is dope. Oh my God. <laughs> this is a wine hack if I've ever seen it. It's just, it's- Oh <laughs> my God. It's too good. It's too good, but I gotta, I gotta flag so this. So is this wild ferment or is it inoculated? It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure like what's natural wine and what's not anymore. Um, but uh, you gotta, you got to have a look at this. So I didn't even know these things existed. This is actually pretty cool. So this is uh, Aldi's, Aldi's website. So Burlwood Cellars. Um, so this is the sort of wine news that you come uh, here, folks, to, to learn. I need to try to figure this because this is like- From this wonderful intellectual conversation about old vine versus new vine to Aldi, like- <laughs> It's the width and like, breadth, brother. They, punch. <laughs> they can't sell wine in Australia yet, Aldi, can they? Yeah, they can. They can. Not in South Australia. Don't Not in South, uh, yeah, yeah. Victoria's all good, South Australia. We're behind. Bloody police Once state that we live in. again. Always, yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. Because everyone wants to see Pacific Fruit Vineyard sweet peach wine on the shelves at $5 a bottle. Not gonna lie, man, that sounds like something I'd buy the hell out of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. interesting, so I'm not too sure how, I'm 90% I'm confident this wine here, they um, they must, it must just be um, like flavor added to wine. Uh, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? It's coming in at 9% alcohol, so it must be, you know, I mean, lower alcohol. We're all pro lower alcohol. Lower, yep. Lower, lower alcohol. Um, is it all right to 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 trick up wine with additional flavors? If someone's allowed to make a wine with smoked with uh, Champion Ruby tobacco, yes, this is allowed. Yeah. I, oh, that was v VHS. VHS. Yeah, yeah, legend. Like, love it. If you're allowed to do that kind of molecular shit to wine, like, go for it. Like, this is. It's it's pretty <laughs> trashy. It's not going to be like you know Grand Cru certified, but I think it's dope. It's more wine. You know, every, I suppose, bartend, I mean. every bartender in the world does this now. They like do all ah. these crazy <laughs> lacto ferments with like bags <laughs> of fruit and shit. So like this is the same thing. It's going on a budget. All yeah. right, on to actual news. Actual news. Uh, so this one came from Wine Searcher. Piermont gets another DOCG. Um, so formerly a subzone uh, of the uh, the DOCG of uh, Asti. That makes uh, Moscato Bianco based sparkling wines. Mm -hmm. Canelli. DOCG um, is dogs over cats group, yeah? <laughs> We've been over this, Henry. Uh, so, no, it's it's one of those appellation things, right? Oh, so, cool. Yeah, so um, much like the French have something called AOC, uh, this, the Italians have uh, Denominazione origina, Origine Controllate Garantita. Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's that. The highest tier of, you know, what were you calling it? A Like a copyright, basically, like a country yeah, copyright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Regional copyright. It guarantees that what you what you get in the bottle, A, is legitimately from there, mm -hmm. but also is made in a particular way or uh, has a degree of quality that, that everyone sort of agrees on. Um, this one's a little bit different, and this is the reason why I reckon it's a really good talking point. Um, the Canelli region actually has 18 different parishes around Canelli um, and uh, has been lobbying actually for this change for many, many years. Reports indicate though, little will actually change in terms of wine style. The new region's likely to maintain the production of sweet, white, aromatic bubbles 
just like RST, mm. except, except, and I think this is where Appalachian might play against people. And it's some Australian, in, in not in wine, but in other areas uh, uh, where Appalachian really come into play. They've kind of done this move. Canelli uh, DOCG will actually allow to sport something called the Reserver title. So Reserver uh, is often used in places like um, uh, Tuscany for Chianti, Chianti Reserver. It's, it's more it's like an elevated status of wine quality. So when you're presented with two products, one is just normal DOCG and one is DOCG kind of super. It's super like DOCG. The different colored labels on Johnny Walker. It's it's like buying a, a Ford Focus and a Ford Focus RS. Yeah, yeah, pretty like much exactly the more. same. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, so now I get it. So, but there's a reason why, and I find it probably more fascinating that um, the Asti DOCG doesn't actually allow you to use Reserva as a title. It's almost like Asti knows that it doesn't produce really sort of high end, high sort of expensive um, uh, styles of wine, and doesn't want to distinguish itself on a shelf as this is Reserva and this is not Reserva. So Canelli has quite literally just separated itself. And correct me if there's anyone like who's watching from Italy as to can, it can give us some sort of context as to why. It sounds just like Canelli wants to break itself off and call, call, put Reserva on the label, get more money for its wines, for its area. But it's still like slight, like lower alcohol, lower alcohol, slightly sparkling Moscato. Is that what they're producing out of Canelli? Yep. I don't want Reserva. I'm good, thanks. I, I want it to be as cheap as possible. Yeah. Like this is a style of wine that you want to be able to chill down, drink quickly for lunch with a couple of mates. Maybe like, put in a 32 ounce Capri Sun sort of thing as well. Well, legit. <laughs> yeah, 100%, yeah. <laughs> Literally. Amen. Spark, sparkling fruit wine sounds great. Like Moscato Dust is like a delicious drink. Last little bit of news, uh, a little bit of bonus one. Uh, also a little fun talking topic. Uh, Catalan cooperatives request a crisis distillation. Uh, so uh, the Catalan Agricultural Cooperatives Federation has requested uh, the regional government to unlock 70 million euro for crisis distillation as the effects of the COVID pandemic show no signs of easing the pressure on production. Um, so basically what's happening here is uh, no one's drinking, I mean, everyone's drinking wine, but they're, they're not drinking the sheer quantity that they grow in this area for carver, carver production, which is the most, I believe, the largest con um, produced sparkling wine in the world is actually a, is actually Spanish sparkling. Um, and so they're actually going to move to try to try to distill it all, which is similar to what Italy did in the 50s when there was an oversupply. Mm -hmm. Australia's answer, of course, was largely to export most of its oversupply in 2011. Um, uh, we've, we've spoken about this before. Um, is this something, do you reckon, we could, with the rise of craft distillation in Australia, that, that this could potentially be an answer to overproduction? In Australia, what? Uh, oh yeah, what are they distilling it, it into? Brandy, cool. I yeah. knew that. <laughs> um, yeah, I like brandy. Why not? Load it up. Don't waste the grapes. Yeah, but is brandy popular? I'm pretty confident most of the viewers on here are going to be like, yeah, brandy, like whatever. Well, it's not as cool as gin. It's not like whiskey. Will brandy have its time again? I think brandy will have its time again. We did. We we. I think we're finding this out. I mean, mm. you. You yourself judged one of the more innovative drinks competitions in the country with Drink Easy, and the number one spirit was a brandy. Yeah, yeah, and so, it was contentious as well, like to be able to, like it was clear that that was the winner. And then when we put it up for the winner, everyone was like, are we sure, are you sure you want to do this? Because what's the message that it's saying? I'm like, well, it's just saying that- This is the best spirit. Dope spirit can be made from anything, yeah. um, but brandy in particular. Uh, well, last year, the French government launched 140 million euro at literally the same, like a same scheme for, for French growers, of which now they don't have any grapes because they all got smashed with hail. Um, but in Australia, it, it's obviously something that we could, uh, I don't know, when was the last time you had brandy? Uh, uh, on purpose? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably uh, Tanunda Basketball Tournament two th like pre-COVID, so that would have been, I don't know, 18 to two years ago. How were you drinking it? Was brandy and Coke? Quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think we were just having a bit neat, sort of one of those things to warm yourself up on a cold Barossa night. I, I'd love to see, you know, I think we've got a really great tool in elevating spirits in Australia, and I'd love to see a lot of bartenders really get behind brandy. That would be really brilliant. Um, I think we've seen that recently with tequila and mezcal. There's been some mm -hmm. really great champions of that product, which has got a pretty bad rap from most drinkers because I'd say about 60 to 70% of all drinkers have a bad tequila slash mezcal story. Yes. So yep. um, if mm -hmm. we, I reckon if we get like good 
bartenders to come up with creative, dr- delicious drinks with brandy, that'll get people excited Are about you it. suggesting that it needs a little bit of a uh, rebranding in the uh, drinking culture? That is the perfect outro. Guys, thank you so much for chiving in uh, another hey. week of Global <laughs> <laughs> News. We'll see you in a week. <laughs>